Our medieval sources for Norse mythology are pretty male-dominated for the most part, but there are two particular goddesses who stand out. Frigg is the wife of Odin and Queen of Asgard, and we don't have much in terms of personal info on her provided in the Eddas. All we have on her background is that her father was some guy named Fjorgvin. She lives in a place in Asgard called Fenselir, and according to Snorri Sturluson in the Prose Edda, she has a number of goddess servants. Fulla is her maidservant with whom she shares her secrets, Hlyn serves as a protector of those favored by Frigg, and Gna travels across the Nine Worlds running errands for Frigg. Aside from the death of Baldur, which I'll make a full video about at some point, the only myth where she really plays an active role is in the frame narrative of the poem Grimnismal. Two young princes, Agnar and his brother Garroth, get lost on a fishing trip and wash up near the home of a farmer and his wife, who take them in. The wife, who is Frigg in disguise, fosters Agnar, while the farmer, Odin, takes Garroth under his wing. Eventually, the two boys set out to return home, but when their boat arrives at their father's harbor, Garroth, having been advised by Odin to steal his brother's birthright, jumps out and shoves Agnar back into the sea to be swept up by the current. Garroth then comes back to the hall of his father, who died in his absence, and he becomes the new king. Meanwhile, Agnar lives the rest of his life in a cave with a troll for a wife. Sometime later, Odin brags to Frigg about how much more successful his foster son turned out to be, but Frigg accuses King Garroth of being uncharitable to his people and torturing visitors. Odin didn't believe this slander, so he made a bet with Frigg that he'd go out to see for himself how hospitable Garroth was. But as Odin set out, Frigg had her servant Fulla go to the king to warn him not to trust any mysterious wizard-looking dudes who come by his hall. So Odin shows up in his usual Gandalf cosplay, and is thrown straight into the dungeon and tortured for eight nights. But on the ninth night, Garroth's son, named after his betrayed uncle Agnar, kindly offers Odin a drink, and in return, Odin tells him a bunch of Norse mythology trivia, and then reveals his true identity to Garroth. Garroth then trips onto his sword and dies, and Agnar Jr. becomes king. And so, in spirit at least, Frigg's foster son regains his rightful crown. Now, according to the prose Edda, the only goddess with status equal to Frigg is Freya. She's the daughter of the Vanir god Njord and sister of Frey. She and her brother's names are actually titles, meaning Lady and Lord, respectively. Frey's original name is believed to be Ingvi, as he's sometimes called in the sources, but Freya's true name is unfortunately lost to time. The two of them were fertility gods, and Freya certainly lived up to her title. Snorri describes her as being prayed to by her worshippers for help with love, and throughout Norse mythology, multiple horny Jotuns hatch elaborate schemes in order to force her into marriage with them. Loki also accuses her of sleeping with literally every god, including Frey. One of Freya's main possessions is her amulet called Briesingamen, though unfortunately our only source for the story of how she got it is from a late 14th century manuscript written by Christian monks. So this version of the story is much further removed from pagan tradition than even the Eddas, and likely highly distorted as a result, if not entirely a later invention. Freya stumbles upon the workshop of some dwarves forging a beautiful necklace. She offers to provide anything they want in return for giving it to her, so they request to sleep with her. Classy dwarves. And after four nights, she returns home with the necklace. Loki catches wind of this and gossips to Odin. Then, under Odin's orders, Loki sneaks into Freya's room as a fly while she's sleeping and steals Bracing Amen. On waking and discovering she'd been robbed, Freya goes straight to Odin, who promptly slut shames her. And he tells her that she can only have the necklace back if she initiates a war between two powerful kings, causing an immense battle, and enchants each warrior to immediately rise from the dead after being slain, until a noble Christian warrior comes with an army to wipe them all out. Again, this story is very obviously distorted distorted from any pagan source it may have originally come from. Our earlier Eddic sources refer vaguely to a different story of how Briesingamen was recovered, with the god Heimdall wrestling Loki as seals to win it back. That sounds like a more fun version. Now these two goddesses, Frigg and Freya, appear on the surface to be distinct characters. However, when you analyze the sources more closely, you start to notice some striking similarities between them. And knowing that surviving Norse mythology is likely different in many ways from earlier pagan tradition, one starts to wonder if they could actually be different versions of the same goddess. But before we learn about the ways Frigg and Freya might be connected, I gotta tell you about some of the things you can learn with our sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform with thousands of hands-on college-level math and science lessons that anyone with any level of prior education can follow. They provide courses in algebra, statistics, computer science, and much more, all in easy-to-follow lessons, perfect if you're looking to learn a practical skill, brush up on a subject, or just satisfy your own curiosity. They even have courses for those who are interested in history. Brilliant's math history course takes you through the fundamental concepts of mathematics from the perspective of the ancient civilizations that discovered them. Another course I've been having a blast with was made in collaboration with the Real Engineering YouTube channel to teach the basics behind space technology like rockets and satellites. And that just scratches the surface of what's waiting to be learned on Brilliant. If you want to start learning
learning today, you can visit brilliant.org slash jakew or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you to sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual subscription plan. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to Friggin' Freya. So the first similarity between Frigg and Freya you might notice just from reading popular Norse myths is that they both own an enchanted falcon suit often borrowed by Loki to fly places. Both goddesses also seem to be associated with magic. Freya is called a witch, and in the poem Voluspa Hinskama, she conjures a dead Jotun woman to tell her the future, and Frigg is said to know the fates of all men, though she keeps this knowledge to herself. This makes it likely both goddesses were linked to the practice of Sade, a mysterious form of Norse pagan divination. Also, both goddesses are married to Odin, maybe. According to the prose Edda, Freya is married to a man named Ode, who spends most of his time away on journeys, leaving her alone crying tears of gold. And Freya often travels in search of her husband under several different aliases. So while Snorri might have interpreted Ode as a distinct god, it's hard not to look at him next to Odin, the other guy who travels a lot and also has dozens and dozens of epithets and aliases used throughout Old Norse sources, and not wonder if they might actually be the same guy, or at least have a common origin in earlier tradition. Another interesting link between Freya and Odin is their shared role in choosing slain warriors. Odin owns the Hall of Valhalla in Asgard, where he brings valiant warriors after they die in battle to serve in his army when Ragnarok comes. In Grimnismal, however, it's said that Freya rules a hall called Folkvang, where she arranges the seats and chooses her own half of the slain warriors. This passage is commonly interpreted to mean that Freya's Folkvang is a separate afterlife from Valhalla. However, Old Norse scholar and Norse mythology educator Jackson Crawford has a different take. He interprets Folkvang to be either another name for Valhalla, or just a separate hall that Freya happens to own, but not a different place that her chosen warriors are taken. Now, I should say that I've never heard any other scholars share Crawford's interpretation. The common consensus is that they're two different places and the dead can go to either one. But I mention it because, if true, it would have Freya serving the role of a hostess in Odin's Valhalla, which is something you would expect of a chieftain's wife. So how might all of these similarities and eyebrow-raising connections have come about? One's first instinct might be to blame Snorri Sturluson for misinterpreting a single goddess, sometimes called by her name Frigg or by her title Freya, as two different characters. He very likely made that kind of mistake in other instances. In the prose Edda, he lists Saga, Hlin, Sjöven, Lovin, and Eir as individual goddesses, but in other sources those names appear to just be epithets. But in the poem Lokasena, Frigg and Freya each appear as two characters in the same room. It wasn't just Snorri who saw them as separate, the idea probably goes back to the Viking Age. So we can be pretty confident that at least in late Icelandic paganism they were commonly viewed as distinct from one another. As for earlier slash broader Scandinavian tradition, well, this is where we start having to accept the limits of our knowledge. Given how fluid and localized Norse pagan tradition probably was, it's very easy to imagine a scenario where we originally had a group with one chieftainess goddess, a Frigg Freya, that group then split into or shared their pantheon with another group, and then over time those groups' versions of their chieftainess goddess evolved independently and were eventually recognized as separate deities. But equally plausible is a scenario where Frigg and Freya originated separately, but through cultural exchange were often conflated with one another and started sharing traits. We don't have a real way of knowing what exactly happened. All we have to go off of is the tattered remnants of a tradition that died a thousand years ago. Looking at the available evidence, I find it very hard to believe there wasn't some connection between these two goddesses. But regarding the exact nature of that connection, as is usually the case with Norse mythology, we can only speculate.